Well, how would you feel about letting Elon Musk loose inside your mind? Well, our next guest did exactly that, volunteering for the first ever Neuralink brain chip. When I first actually moved the cursor with my mind, it blew my mind for like a whole day. And to be helping, to be able to be useful in some way, it completely changed how I live. Paralyzed from the neck down after a diving accident eight years ago, 30-year-old Noland Arbor is the first person to be implanted with Neuralink's brain chip. It was like uh, using the force. The technology promising to allow him and others with paralysis to control technology with their minds. The device is designed to interpret your neural activity so you can operate a computer or a smartphone by simply thinking about moving. In less than two hours, 64 threads, thinner than a human hair, containing over 1,000 electrodes, are attached to a patient's brain, transforming a person's thoughts into actions. Noland now able to operate an iPad, play chess, even dominate at Mario Kart. Arbor is the first participant in a six-year trial to test the safety of Neuralink's device, Musk spooking the upsides of his latest invention. Imagine if Stephen Hawking could communicate faster than a speed typist or auctioneer. That is the goal. For now, though, Nolan is just happy with his latest upgrade. I am basically like all of y'all, um, just with a bit of hardware in my head skull, a bit more compute power, and that's about it. <laughs> Nolan joins us now. Nolan, this has been tested on pigs and monkeys, but you are the first person, the first human to have this procedure. What made you want to be the first guinea pig? Yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, I just wanted to do my part and help um, move this technology forward. Um, there's a lot of promise in this. There's a lot of good that it can do for the world. And I just felt like if anyone should take that step and take that plunge, then it should be me. And I will take any of the headache and heartache out of it for anyone coming after me. Anything that'll go wrong would go wrong with me. And uh, I pray that that doesn't happen. And it really hasn't so far. But yeah, it's been, it's been great. I thought that, um, you know, why not me? With any surgery, there are risks. Did they warn you that something might go wrong or could go mm. wrong during the surgery? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there was a laundry list of um, risks involved with this, with the implant, with the surgery. I had to read through them all. I talked with my parents about them. As a quadriplegic, my brain is one of the few things that I have left. And so that was a bit daunting. But, you know, I, again, I just was at complete peace with the whole thing. And uh, I knew that you know, somewhere deep down, I just knew that everything was going to work out, and here I am. Nolan, you spoke to your parents. How did they feel and the rest of your family feel about you going through this? Yeah, like I said, I talked with them every step of the way. I told them uh, right up front that if at any point in time they weren't comfortable with me doing the surgery, that they could tell me and I would back out. I have a great relationship with my parents. And, um, you know, I did play a little prank on my mom after I got out of surgery. First thing I did waking up, they came in the room and I just wanted her to know that I hadn't changed. So she came in and she said, you know, hi, how are you? How do you feel? And I looked at her and I just said, who are you? And she, she was not happy about it. She was oh, um, no, looking around at the doctors you? like, someone please, like, what, uh, like, what, please someone tell me, what did you do to my son? And then she looked at my face and I was grinning and I said, mom, it's, it's okay. Like, uh, I'm fine. Um, <laughs> she had a few tears streaming down her face, but um, I, I, yeah, I know, I know, I'm a terrible son. <laughs> So much for all that love and trust. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can you just help us understand what the practical differences are that this makes to your life now? What's actually changed? Yeah, I mean, it's something as simple as mm, sending a text message. Um, I can send a text message now in, you know, a few seconds and under a minute. Before, when I was using different assistive devices, it would sometimes take me 5, 10, 15 minutes to send a text. And it's little things like that that add up. I don't know whether this is possible, but can you describe no. for us what you have to do 
to send, for example, a text? Like, how do you, in your like brain, Talil? yeah, like, what, what do you actually have to do? Yeah, so, um, as of right now, we're still very early days with this technology. The first thing that they wanted to do was get cursor control. Um, so that means I can use a computer um, just as anyone else can with a cursor. And so for now, I have a virtual keyboard that pops up and I can use the cursor to text on that. I have a dictation that I can use the text on that to send messages. But we're in working right now trying to um, figure out different ways to get me to text, uh, to write sentences and things. Wow. Um, like one of the things we're doing right now is finger spelling. It is uh, like sign language to see if I can attempt to do sign language. Obviously I can't move, but my brain still picks up my intention. And so if I'm trying to do sign language, say, and I am spelling out a word, then my brain picks that up, the Neuralink transfers that to the computer and a words will come up. Is it kind of like <laughs> telepathy? You just think it and it happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a difference between attempted movement and imagined movement in this field. Attempted movement is I attempt to move my hand left or right and the Neuralink picks that up and translates that. But then there's something called imagine movement, which is me not trying to move my hand at all, just thinking cursor go here, cursor go there, wow. and it'll do that. Um, so I can just look around my screen and the cursor will follow. I can look away from my screen and still move the cursor. It's all uh, pretty fascinating, honestly. Have you spoken to Elon Musk since you've had this put in your brain? I mean, feels like he owes you, like he should give you a Tesla or something, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't say no, um, let's just put it that way. Uh, I have spoken to him, and then I met him right after surgery. Um, he came in, he was wearing a sweet bomber jacket, um, and, you know, it was, it was great. It was, it was really cool to meet him. He seems like, a, seems like a pretty cool dude. This is so cool. Nolan, thank you so much for chatting to us. Uh, your mm -hmm. outlook is just brilliant on life. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to say, I, if I have 30 more seconds, um, I'm not sure if any of y'all know this, but during my accident, um, the people who actually saved my life were a couple of Australians. Oh. Um, they were working with me at the summer camp, uh, two girls. Um, they were two of my best friends, oh. and they were both lifeguards. They had just done backboard training a couple of days prior. And um, if I can, I would like to say thank you so much to Nat Wabis and Bridget Jackson. I am um, so thankful that y'all were there from the bottom of my heart, um, truly. And if any of uh, you watching this know them, go up and give them a big hug for me. Uh, I love you both. And um, yeah, yeah, I think that's good. Nolan, it's just incredible and we can see how emotional this is for you. Thanks for talking to us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me.